Zoe, hi, hello, and welcome to the Female Startup Club podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to dig in. Can you give us a little bit of an intro to who you are and the businesses you've built? Um, so Zoe Securitas, um, if coming to you from New York City, Brooklyn specifically. Um, and yeah, so I um, started up Blueprint, uh, was the first sort of... Um, <laughs> The first brand way back in 2007, and uh, along with my partner Erica, um, has we we um, gave that a go. Oddly enough, um, right during the the crash, the mortgage crisis, which was probably not the best timing, but in some ways kind of interesting. Um, but Blueprint was basically, you know, an answer to my own need at the time, which had to do with the fact that you know I was really into um, sort of nutrition, uh, you know, this idea of healing yourself through food. I was like a hardcore raw foodist. I kind of went way down the rabbit hole. And, um, you know, this, uh, idea of fasting and juicing and detoxing and, and healing through foods was so intriguing to me, but I couldn't find it anywhere that was, you know, presented in a way that was convenient or, you know, made me sort of like proud to carry around everything at the time was pretty crunchy and hippie and weird. So that, you know, it was, it was really a, an answer to, to my own need, which was like, can someone take this fringe concept that's super beneficial, incredibly healthy, not enough people know about, and just present it to people in a way that is like consumer friendly and not dogmatic and approachable and actually looks like sleek. Like you, you want to carry it around. It's sort of like a badge of honor. Um, so yeah, that was back in 2007 when no one, uh, you know, nobody heard of plant-based people certainly weren't talking about eating like raw foods and detoxing and fasting and juicing. And now it's just like, I mean, I can't even, I can't believe how common it is. It's like intermittent fasting. Everyone's like got their, um, you know, their day carved out every week where they do it. It's just so commonplace now. It's, it's great. I mean, it really blows my mind. Absolutely. And you had since then another brand kind of in between Erzo, and then now you have your third brand, Earth and Star. Yeah. So we um, scaled Blueprint, sold it, kind of took a very small, short victory lap. You know, it took a little bit of time off. I had like a couple of kids. Um, and you know, we were kind of like, how do we, how do we keep this conversation going? How do we keep like a foot in this wellness world? It's definitely something that's not, um, you know, it's not slowing down. The interest is still there. There's always curiosity. And so we, I think, um, and maybe this is sort of like a warning to everyone who tries to start a business when they're, when they're pregnant, because your brain actually does shrink. Um, just wait, just wait till the baby's out. Um, so that's actually when we started, that's actually when we, we started Erzo, which was supposed to be a sort of, I think it was still, and probably still is kind of slightly ahead of its time, but it was a, a food form of, uh, of multivitamin essentially in a like cookie form. And, you know, there was obviously a lot of learning in that we, we gave it a go. We realized a year in that it was just like so such a heavy lift in terms of the financing required. And, you know, after a year of R&D and legal, we just decided like, hey, this is a really pretty brand that's useful to a market that's potentially not big enough to pursue further. And we kind of just shelved it and said like, okay, moving on. <laughs> so um, it was a lot, you know, we definitely learned a lot in that experience. Um, but, you know, after that, it was, again, the same kind of conversation around, like, how do we stay involved in this space, in this industry? Um, and not necessarily through a product. It wasn't like, we have to come up with the next, you know, consumer product, you know, that's got X, Y, and Z superfood and is going to do all, all these things. It was really just like, all right there's probably like an easier way to stay involved in this conversation. And like, why don't we just start a podcast? Like there's some super low hanging fruit. <laughs> like, why don't we keep the conversation going? Like we know enough people in the space by now where we can continue conversations with like experts around subjects that we wanted to dive deep into um, 
entrepreneurs, founders who were starting interesting businesses, you know, in the wellness space. And so, um, yeah, that was like a very fun and easy way to keep the conversation going and, and stay involved. Um, and so we've been doing that for a couple of years. Um, but, you know, kind of not so intentionally, we just found ourselves at one point, like, you know, going through our like nine bottle deep uh, supplement cabinet and being like, God, you know, this this um, mushroom extract that I've been taking for like the past year now is kind of blowing my mind. And we just stumbled upon this conversation and we had both been taking functional mushroom extracts for, you know, the better part of a year and um, for different reasons. I mean, I think I, I gravitated more toward, towards the like lion's mane and the sort of like cognitive functionality. Erica's not great with like sleep. So she was doing all this like reishi. And we had this moment where we we're like, God, you know, I stopped taking it and it, it was so incredibly noticeable. Like I noticed it immediately. And um, we, it just really piqued our interest at that point. And we said like, this is super effective. Um, there's a ton of science on it. Uh, it's really interesting, just the mushroom space in general. There are a handful of brands that are doing it right now, but like no one's doing it in a delicious, convenient way. Like everything is a powder or a pill or a tincture, like I have to, I have to mix something. It's at least two steps. And then I need like a frother sometimes. And then I have to like mix it. And then it's, you know, the final product is like clumpy and, you know, it, it doesn't taste that good. So we were just like, I think this is kind of an interesting opportunity. And the moment we just pulled the thread on that sweater, it was like, oh, this is incredible. Um, like the mushroom space, like the efficacy there, where it was going, um, the use cases, I mean, it was just kind of mind blowing, I liken it to discovering like, you know, raw foods and juicing. It was like, oh my God, this feels incredible. Like, why don't more people know about this? So, you know, we decided let's just go after this in a way that we know best, which just so happens to be where there is some white space right now, um, which was ready to drink. And we're like, okay, we know beverage, um, sort of. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I say that because like Blueprint was truly like, there was no Blueprint for, for that. Like there was, no one was selling raw unpasteurized juice. It was just insanity. Um, but now, you know, so with this product, it was ready to drink. There's like a co-packer for it, you know, so it's a slightly less daunting. It's daunting in some ways, but so we got, you know, we, we sort of like rolled up our sleeves. We got very involved. Um, almost like two years of R and D, uh, in creating this formulation. Um, and you know, we, we wanted to do it the right way, obviously. So we don't have to do it, reformulate again. So it's super clean label. You know, there's no junk in it. There's no like gums or seed oil. I can't believe how many like coffee brands have like canola oil or sunflower oil in their <laughs> coffee. Um, there's no sugar alcohol. There's no stevia, like nothing weird. It's truly like a very clean label. So we worked really hard on that for a very long time. Um, totally self-funded it still to date. Um, we have a couple small individuals, but, um, you know, we're just now launching it and it's kind of crazy because we've been working on it forever. And again, it's like, oh, how did we manage to la launch like another business during a like crisis? <laughs> it's like this time it's a pandemic. Um, but in a funny way, it's 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 helping with the messaging, right? Because we obviously didn't plan it, but first and foremost, like what functional mushrooms do is regulate your immune system. So it couldn't have been more timely. It was just like, oh my God, we just like came out with a product that's what everyone in this on this planet needs like desperately on a daily basis, you know, basically just to like, you know, support their immune system, regulate it. Um, so that was kind of a, a fun discovery, a little like silver lining in a pandemic. <laughs> well, um, wow. First of all, holy moly, this is such a long journey for you both and so exciting. I feel like you've been through really like major highs, major lows. Um, I'm keen to kind of touch on all three of the businesses. 
usually we focus on how you're building the biggest business, how you grew it, that kind of thing. But with Blueprint Cleanse, I want to talk about more that exit piece because it's something we haven't discussed a lot on the show and I want to understand that side of business a bit more. So what I'm wondering is when you started that business, was there always a clear vision or pathway to exit from like the get-go or did that come later? No, I think that was very, very um, clear in my mind. Uh, I was not interested. In fact, it was, you know, it was sort of looking around and seeing all these juice bars and thinking like, this is some dated, you know, this is such a dated approach. Like, I don't, I'm so not interested in, I'm interested in juicing and fasting and detoxing. I'm not interested in like opening up a chain of juice bars. Like, I want to like really innovate here. Um, and and eventually grow it to the point that, yes, we can sell it. Um, so scalability was um, out of the gate, was was definitely something that we wanted to do um, so that we could eventually exit. Um, and, you know, it, it, I guess it sounds strange because looking back, I'm like, wow, it really kind of surprises me. It's like, yes, that was always the intention. Um, but so with Blueprint, we... Um, you know, we didn't ever raise money. Um, so I think a lot of people don't realize that because it's pretty unheard of. I didn't actually know how rare that was <laughs> until after we sold it. Um, but we were, you know, basically, I think I got like a couple thousand dollars from my brother. I was like, hey, I want to do this like juice cleanse thing. And he didn't know what I was talking about. I was like, sure, but just pay me back. And, you know, I think I maxed out my credit card with like $25,000 and, you know, counted on the kindness of strangers to give, you know, give a little corner space in their kitchen. Um, and that was really a bootstrap company um, the entire way. And so we never took, out, took on outside investment. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, we started direct to consumer, we were selling this cleanse program, we were delivering raw product across the country, um, nationally. And then we cracked the code on HPP. We were basically trying to figure out how to get on shelves and you could not get on shelves if you were a raw product. So that, um, you know, that put us to work to try and find a solution that wouldn't compromise the integrity of the juice. So in other words, we couldn't heat it because that would just be going backwards. So we were the first to also um, apply HPP to juice. So that was a very, HPP is um, what is used on every cold pressed juice now. So basically HPP is a pressurized way to treat the juice so that it inhibits the growth of bacteria and it makes it safe for consumers. Um, and the reason it's attractive um, is because <coughs> it, you know, it maintains the nutritional integrity of the juice, it maintains the enzyme activity, um, and it's super fresh and it doesn't affect the flavor. Um, so we applied that, that was kind of like a, you know, definitely a game changing moment. We were able to get on shelves and scale through Whole Foods and all the rest. Um, and right when we did that, you know, still hadn't raised any money. Um, it was a really nice business model in that way. <laughs> it was always like cash flow positive. Uh, but we got a call from um, Mr. Howard Schultz himself, who, if you don't know him, he's the founder of Starbucks. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like, oh, okay, I guess we know who our competition is now. You know, like we we were wondering when like the bigger players were going to come in and kind of like try and eat our lunch. And, um, you know, the first call from Howard Schultz was like a good sign that they were entering. And so he said, hey, I love what you're doing. I am interested in entering this space. And, you know, he um, made us an offer. We had a bit of a courtship. Um, it was like a few months of, trying to see if we could strike a deal. And uh, ultimately we passed. We thought it was just too early. We were too um, like on the eve of ex explosive growth, really having just applied this HPP and getting in nationally to, to pretty major accounts. So we did not go forward with that. He ended up buying actually Evolution, um, which you see in every Starbucks, at least in the US. Um, and so it's another cold pressed juice. Um, and so, that sort of put us in play earlier than we wanted. We we knew at that point that we we needed a partner because we needed a 
pretty big cash infusion if we were going to compete with what we saw coming down, you know, down the path, which was like the bigger players like Pepsi, Coke, Starbucks, et cetera. So um, at that point, we actually engaged a broker to help us like start conversations with uh, potential investors. And so uh, otherwise, I don't know if we would have done it, but um, but we did have, you know, we had a couple of conversations with PepsiCo and entertained a few different structures, you know, minority partnership, majority partnership. Um, and ultimately, you know, this is 2012, end of 2012. Um, and we ended up selling just a full on acquisition to Haines Celestial, um, which at the time seemed and still seems like it was the right choice. Um, we could have taken on a smaller investment, um, and grown and then probably had a shinier exit probably a few years later with a much higher, um, valuation and obviously less of the pie, but, you know, it felt a little risky that, that, that space was like really blowing up, getting super saturated, super competitive. We were kind of the pioneers and it, it just, it felt like, it felt like we were kind of wise enough at the time to see around the corner that it was just too crowded, too competitive. And, uh, you know, not everyone was going to make it to the finish line. And so we kind of just took that opportunity when when we could and definitely don't regret it. Wow. Goodness. How exciting. When you were going through that process, what is it? And this might sound like a really stupid question, but like, what is it that buyers are actually looking for in a business? And I mean, like, is it revenue? Is it profitability? Is it like customer awareness in the market? What What's interesting to a buyer? All of those things, really. I think you have to have like sort of every box checked. Um, you know, obviously, rev revenue was very important. Like year over year growth is very important. Um, they want to see you growing at a certain percentage year over year. Um, they want to see really strong customer engagement. A lot of repeat. I think now it's like it's so heavily like um, like subscription, everything is like subscription based. So I think that's such a big piece of the puzzle for a lot of brands. Um, but at the time, you know, we didn't have, uh, again, this was sort of like pre Amazon. I mean, it existed, but not in the way it does now. It was sort of pre social media. It was like just starting. Um, so now all of those things like hold value. Like when you think about your social engagement and the rest, but I think even that might be starting to, to lessen a bit because so much, of, I mean, because social media, Instagram is just so noisy as well. It's hard to quantify like the value there, um, especially when it comes to like true authentic engagement. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think ultimately uh, what makes your business valuable is the, is the pull, you know, it's the growth. It's, it's not how much I can spend to push this out the door. It's like, how much are you spending? What's your, what's your return? Um, how much are you paying for that customer? Um, and obviously, the less you can pay for a customer, the much sexier the, the deal is. Um, with Blueprint, like we had no, you know, we didn't never did any traditional advertising. There was no social media. Like word of mouth was incredibly strong. I mean, the product at the end of the day was like so experiential. Um, but but yeah, we 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 never really spent a lot there, and I think that was probably a very attractive part too. Is it publicly disclosed how much you sold the business for? And if so, are you able to share what that exit looked like? I think it is. It was like mid, I like don't even remember. It was like mm, somewhere around 25 million. And then we had like a, we stayed on for a couple of years and then we had a additional earn out that was tied to sales. Right. Okay. So you stayed with the business for a few years afterwards to kind of keep growing it, keep that momentum. And then you're able to step away. Did you also have to say like, oh, I won't create another business in this same kind of category? Yeah. So we had to, um, you know, we had a non-compete for um, after our earn out period was over. And after we left pain, we had, uh, it was probably like a couple of years of non-compete where we couldn't um, work for another juice brand, um, which is totally fine because we were juice fatigued at that point. I want to actually kind of merge into business number three because we kind of spoke a little bit about Erzo and, and why you thought the timing potentially wasn't right there. 
What do you think was like the takeaways that you were able to use from business number one, kind of like the blueprints from, lol, pun intended, the blueprints you use from number one that still work today in building a business and the things that you really had to shift and do differently in today's landscape? It's a good question. I think we, you know, we think about that a lot and, you know, kind of see what we could apply and, and try and look back at that experience. Definitely not forget, you know, some, some hidden gems there and, and, and what we could learn in the takeaway. And honestly, it's a very different world now. And so there are, there, are, there, are, yeah, I mean, pandemic aside, it's uh, even before that, it's like, again, social media didn't exist direct to consumer did not exist. Like really, it was, it was crazy that we were shipping people juice. It was like insane. Um, and perishable juice that had to be refrigerated. You know, it was just like, um, but I think one of the takeaways is, you know, one thing that has not changed is that, you know, you have to have, <laughs> obviously your product has to be really good. Like there's just no getting around, you know, can I can I curse on this show? Um, there's no getting around like shitty, you know, garbage in a, in a can, garbage in a bottle. It's like, if your product isn't good, it's just, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, so we spent a lot of time um, and a lot of money, like getting the products to the point where it is actually quality. Like people crave it. Like it is efficacious. It is delivering on the promise and not just from a taste, you know, standpoint, but, um, you know, from a functionality standpoint. Um, so that's key and that hasn't changed. And I find it shocking even, you know, sometimes when I taste some, some products that are on the market and I'm like, how, like, who gave, like, who greenlit this product? This is shocking to me that people will actually consume this. You know, obviously I won't name any names, but it's just like, I don't know if you're just, I get like you, you're in such a hurry sometimes and you just want to get to market and you want to be done with the, R and D because it's such a pain in the ass. Um, it's incredibly expensive, but you know, at the end of the day, if you don't have a good product, like you're kind of screwed. Um, and so, you know, another another very applicable um, you know rule from Blueprint Days is people. And you know, my partner and I were still partners. We're like officially work wives. Um, but beyond that, it's truly like you have to make sure you're surrounding yourself, you know, with the right people. Um, and we're, you know, we, we basically tapped a lot of the same, um, partners that we had for blueprint, you know, whether it was like a creative agency or, I mean, it's so valuable to have that experience and that shorthand. Um, so that's been, you know, that's been key, I think, in like keeping the pace and, um, and going faster. And I mean, the other thing is just persistence, specifically when it comes to educating. I think one of the most important things a brand, um, one of the biggest challenges a brand has potentially, at least in this space, is education. And the cost to educate a consumer is, is high. Um, and so when you have a concept or a product that is somewhat complicated, um, you know, we're not selling a cookie. We're selling like, we're selling a functional latte that has like the word mushrooms in it, which is like, what the hell are you talking about? And I've never, I've never even heard of these mushrooms. And like, what do they do again? I mean, it's kind of like the hour long conversation that goes into describing like what the hell we're actually doing <laughs> is a very cost effect or it's very, it's very expensive. Um, so with blueprint, it was the same way. I mean, it was, people would literally look at me like I had three heads when I would say like, Oh, I have this like juice company. It's all about, you know, basically you do three days of juicing or five days of juicing and you don't consume anything, but these like six, uh, cold pressed juices that, that we made. And you're going to pay us like $65 every day to do that. And they're just like, what are you talking about? How am I not going to die? How am I going to not eat for three days? You know, so it was a lot of explaining, a lot of educating. And I think that's very applicable to what we're doing now. I find that the, the conversation is, is, is very much the same. And like, you have to explain the benefits, explain why you're doing it. It's not a silver bullet. It's very much about prevention, long-term health, et cetera. So how do you 
actually educate at scale? Like how do you have that hour-long conversation in a easy-to-digest, snackable piece of information? It's a really good question. And if I knew, <laughs> we'd, be a, we'd be in a much better position. I'll say with Blueprint, it was, um, again, it was very word of mouth. So once you tap into, um, I'll say the early adopters and the enthusiasts, the ambassadors are super valuable. I think if you can find them and give them the tools to go out and evangelize and and talk about the product in the same way that you would, because they have the enthusiasm, they have the knowledge. Um, If you can give them the tools, that's one great way to approach educating the consumer. Um, because it always starts with them. Um, and so with Blueprint, we were lucky that we did have a lot of, I mean, they were hardcore. They were just like, all they wanted to do was talk to other people about what they were doing. And like, it's sort of like superior kind of like tone. Um, but so um, it's probably not dissimilar with with Earth and Star. I think, you know, once people understand functional mushrooms, it is kind of like, you want to talk about it. It's kind of mind blowing once you realize the the powers um, of functional mushrooms. But I think one surprising area that has been super valuable for educating um, is podcasts. Surprisingly, I mean, Instagram is in social media in general, I think is so noisy. It's so crowded. It's so, it's so visual. The attention span is so short. Um, it doesn't really seem like the best platform to communicate the finer, you know, points of what we're actually trying to do here. Whereas podcasting, and we've done a little bit of testing on this. Um, and so far it's, it's, it, it has played out in, in, in that way. So podcasting has been way more effective than, spending dollars on Instagram. Um, And I think it's because you have a willing participant on the other end. They're willing to actually listen to the ad because they're listening to, um, you know, they're they're choosing to listen to and engage in a very long and sort of intimate way. And so if you have that trust, then once you drop in an ad and, or if it's like a advertorial where the host is talking about their own experience, there's that trust there. Um, And so that's really gone a long way. And there's, there's the attention span, right? There's like the, the willingness to kind of sit through 30 whole seconds of like an explanation of something. So that's been like a very interesting, um, that's been a very interesting and refreshing discovery, because honestly, the thought of, you know, being another uh, voice in on IG right now is slightly nauseating to me. I mean, it's so interesting you bring this up. I actually hadn't spoken about, you know, podcast advertising on the show before. No one's actually mentioned that as kind of their their route. And it makes so much sense when you say it. And I also feel like when I just think about myself consuming content on social media today, Instagram feels so draining and so like, ugh, you know, I feel like TikTok truly changed the the vibe of Instagram. Everyone was like, oh, you know what? It doesn't have to be polished. It doesn't have to be static, boring, you know, make you feel bad about yourself. It can be fun, quick, you know, and it totally shifted my perception of Instagram. I'm obviously a podcast enthusiast, love to listen to to shows and consume content that way. But specifically when it comes to Instagram, I've like so seen a switch to how I feel about that platform versus something like TikTok. It's so interesting how quick it's been. Yeah. It, 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 I, and I don't, I don't even understand how it can keep going, but I guess it will. I mean, Facebook is still here, <laughs> but it is, um, yeah, it's an interesting, it's interesting. I, like I did not realize it was going to be, um, as effective as it has been podcasting that is. Um, but, and I know a lot of, you know, I've had conversations with other, um, business owners where they're just like, I'm, you know, taking all of my dollars out of Instagram and putting it into like experiential in real life. I mean, obviously it's hard to do now, but we're getting there again. Um, Because I think, and maybe we will feel even more of a backlash after we kind of like 
crawl out of our caves post pandemic um, to this like yearning for in real life experiences again and, and like get off the phone, get off the zoom, get off the screens. It just, it, it, it's, it feels not good. It feels real icky now. Mm-hmm. I agree. I'm with you. I, I feel that <laughs> I'm so sick of the screen. <laughs> Where is the business today? Like, what does the team look like? What cool things can you shout about? What's going on? So, um, yeah, we, uh, you know, we officially (laughs) launched, um, met six weeks ago at retail, um, which has been very exciting to see finally, like, real feedback um, and positive feedback. So we're at all the Air One markets in LA. Um, that's a great audience for us, sort of like the destination for wellness discovery. Um, and, you know, we have a very, very skeleton team. We have my partner, Erica and I, we have a couple of in-house people who are doing social and customer service. And outside of that, everything is kind of bolted on. Everything is outsourced. So, you know, our... Um, obviously PR is outsourced. Our creative agency is outsourced. Um, we have an R and D team. We have, it's like, you can really, uh, get away with a skeleton crew for a very long time these days. I mean, there are so many groups that you can just hire, um, so many consultants. Uh, so we are just launched at retail. We're obviously available on our website, direct to consumer, we will be on Amazon in the next, hopefully a couple of weeks. Um, and then we have a lot of interesting sort of direct partnerships, um, that have been going very well. So these sort of like hybrids of like store, like Foxtrot, I don't know if you know them, but they're a new and kind of awesome retailer and they have real stores, but they do, I think most of their business direct, um, to consumer. So we kind of resell through them. And then, you know, of course, we are finally at the point where we're going out with our little tin can and asking people for money. (laughs) So we have, um, you know, we're we're raising a seed round now, like literally right now, uh, just starting to to have these conversations. We've been self-funded for the most part to date. And, um, you know, now it's time to to go out and do a proper round, which is very funny because we've never raised money before. (laughs) And so it it all feels very new. And I have to say so far, it's been um, somewhat of a soul destroying process. Um, You know, it's hard. It's hard to ask people for money. It's hard to have those conversations. It's hard to sell yourself um, and your idea before it's been proven out in the market. And basically everybody wants proof of concept before they write you a check. So the whole thing feels very chicken and egg to me and slightly frustrating, but we will persist. Um, and hopefully we can kind of like walk this line for, you know, a while more, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not easy as uh, female founders either. I, I will say that I've, I've been sort of in this space long enough to hear the the conversations around me and the, and the male led startups who have been funded quite easily, very fast, sometimes like pre-seed, sometimes even before pre-seed. And so um, we unfortunately have not had that experience, which is kind of, you know, I will say it's a bit of a head scratch, um, especially because we have a, a track record um, of a successful exit and then like one that we bootstrapped. So it's kind of, it's, you know, it's been a bit, frustrating on that front, but, um, that is the goal. So hopefully, uh, we'll, we will close that, that round in the next few months. If anybody's listening. <laughs> I mean, I feel like you would be the master of persistence and you know, that long, long journey well. So I'm sure you're going to get all the things that you want out of the round. What I also find mind blowing is you learn so much. Like you're totally upskilling in again, a new thing that you've been in business since 2007. That's wild. And yet now you're just learning this whole other side of things that you hadn't learned before. It's kind of amazing how much you just keep learning and keep upskilling and adding to your little, you know, pile of stuff that you know. 
Yeah, it really has been. Um, I don't even re- I mean, sometimes I'm like, wow, I actually know quite a bit in this space. And, and again, it's like, it's a very different, it's obviously a very different landscape and a very different time. But the two, you know, Blueprint compared to Earth and Star in terms of just the business model alone are so different. Um, you know, if if I didn't have capital right now, just personally, I would not be able to start this. I wouldn't be able to bootstrap it on my own. It's just a very different model. It's a shelf-stable product. It's very inventory um, heavy. Like Blueprint was made to order. I could go to the store. I could buy a juicer. I mean, it was literally like, it's why it was cash flow positive from day one. The uh, the the heavy lifting on on this brand on Earth and Star is you know it's um it's heavy, so I'm learning about this type of model as well, and and it's quite different. Mm, very interesting and exciting. What do you think your key piece of advice is for women who have a big idea and want to start their own business? I guess, you know, and I feel like I have a lot of these conversations with friends who have business ideas often and I don't know, maybe (laughs) this is a tough one. I'm going to try and say it without sounding like totally negative and insulting, but I'm thinking like what I tell myself sometimes um, is like not every idea that I have is like an awesome idea that should be pursued. Like, I mean, that sounds very negative, but I I have to like check myself very awesome, very often. And it's like, Oh, that's like funny or whatever. Maybe I should do it. And they're like, Oh no, Uh, that was not necessarily like the best idea. Like move on, move on, try something else. I think, I don't know what, what I would tell people is like probably what, so many other people would say is just talk to a lot of people about your idea. You know, if you have an idea for something, get as much feedback as you can, like research it a lot. Don't get like analysis paralysis with it to the point that you don't ever actually do it. But I think it is important to get, to get feedback and to have conversations. And, you know, it's always surprising to me how many people, if you reach out to them, are so willing to sit down with you for 10 minutes and just say like, Hey, like, yeah, sure. Pick my brain. Happy to give you feedback. Like I'm happy to do. I feel like I have these types of conversations all the time and they're valuable. Um, people ask me, you know, if they could pick my brain and I ask plenty of people, uh, you know, if, like, Hey, can I just like talk to you about this idea for like 10 minutes? Just want to get your take. And sometimes that can be really, really enlightening. Um, and, and, can reveal something that maybe you never thought of. Um, so I think it's interesting to get um, as much as many different perspectives as possible. Mm, yeah, I love that. That's a really good one. At the end of every episode, I ask a series of six quick questions. Some of them we might have touched on, but we'll go through it anyway. <laughs> Question number one, what's your why? Why are you doing what you're doing? Oh. God, <laughs> I don't know. It's funny. Everyone in the beverage industry is like, why are you doing this again? <laughs> like, haven't you learned your lesson? I don't know. My why is like, um, this will make people feel better. Like this is something that people need. Um, truly. I, I think it's like a, it's so beneficial for everyone's health and it's so undiscovered and untapped. So the why is like, because we need it. Love that. Love it. Question number two is what do you think, and this could apply to this business or blueprint cleanse. What do you think has been the number one marketing moment that had made your business pop? Um, Oh, I'll use Blueprint for this example because it's just hysterical Um, because it's back in the day when like Oprah ruled with like, you know, if you wrote a book and it's like, oh my God, Oprah's book club, like the moment Oprah talked about you, you're like, you know, your website broke. Um, So second to Oprah, sort of like next wave of Oprah during that time was like these digital like subscription. I don't know if you know Daily Candy. Do you know Daily Candy? Back in the day, because they were, they were one of the first kind of like, think about like an early goop, just like an early newsletter. And they had such a crazy reach. Um, 
and a readership. And so they picked us up and uh, like on year, you know, halfway through year one, and it literally like shut down our website, like phones exploding. Like we couldn't, we didn't have the bandwidth. It just, it sounds so beta and funny now, but it really put us on the map. And it's talk about like a time when it just wasn't that noisy on, on the internet. Gosh, exciting. Breaking the internet, literally. I mean, our website broke. (laughs) <laughs> question number three is where do you hang out to get smarter what are you reading or listening to or subscribing to where do I go to get smarter I mean honestly I guess I'll just come back to this again but I think it's podcasts I listen to so many podcasts and I think it's because I can it sort of like dovetailed off this discovery of audibles and I was like oh I can listen to so I can like I will plow through more books if I'm listening to them than physically holding a book in my hand which is not as romantic as I'd like it to be but it's effective and I find that to be true with podcasts so I find that if I can search a subject if I you know want to get more of like a condensed version um sometimes it's a really great resource for learning I mean podcasting listening to podcasts, finding podcasts that have um, obviously subjects that you're interested in. I mean, you could go really deep on some of these podcasts. So that's, I mean, I I feel like I've learned so much from that. Mm, Absolutely. Any in particular that you recommend? I'm I'm a little bit, it gets a little dorky sometimes. Like, uh, I don't know if you like hardcore history. Um, Didn't see that one coming, did you? No, but I I think a lot of these wellness podcasts, um, I think our podcast is actually good. Um, I read it well, but you know, I think anyone who is interviewing um, experts, you know, on subjects that you're interested in. Um, Steve Gundry has a great podcast. Um, He's a doctor. Uh, He's sort of all about lectins. He's like the lectin dude. Um, You know, My Body Green, I think does a good Good job on their podcasts. Um, they have a good, although they're getting a little too celebrity focused now. I like the dorky experts. Like I want to go deep on like one subject. Um, you know, so it's kind of like there are so many. There are so many. So I, th- I find if you search by, I think if you search by subject, it's a lot more effective than searching like the title of the podcast. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And of course, Dak Shepard, who I... Great. I'm going to link those below in the show notes for anyone that's listening. Question number four is how do you win the day? What are your AM or PM rituals slash habits that keep you feeling successful, motivated, happy? Oh my God. Am I winning the day? I don't know. Did I win the day today or yesterday? Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I think things that keep me motivated night tennis. <laughs> I feel like I like to play a lot of tennis. Um, I, I, I haven't had that before on the show. <laughs> no, I know. I, I wish I could say something like I start every morning with meditation and then I do it again at four o'clock and I always drink my like X, Y, and Z in the morning, but I really don't. I mean, I definitely take a lot of supplements and I feel like that does a lot for me. Obviously I take a lot of functional mushrooms, um, but I don't have like, such a specific routine. I mean, I have like two two kids and feel like I'm always sort of catching up with myself. Um, so I don't know. I think I win the day if I if I'm if I'm not talking negatively about the things that I didn't do. I feel like that's kind of like I'm like, you know what? If I can end the day with saying something like, I didn't do everything on my list today and that's okay. I did a lot and I'm making progress and I'm all about micro progress and micro steps. That is like winning the day for me. It's like, I did some of those things. That's fine. I'm all about the micro progress and the micro steps. That 1%, just be 1% better in whatever it is. Just aim for the 1%. And then the compound effect over a couple of years time is going to be crazy, exponential. Totally. Whew. Question number five, where are we up to? If you only had $1,000 left in the business bank account, where would you spend it? It's a great question because we do have $1,000 left in our business account. Again, any investors who are listening. Um, if I had $1,000 left in my business account and I already have my product done, it's ready to go. 
it's a hypothetical. You can have the product done. It can be ready to go. I don't know. I think, you know, I think I would spend it on podcast advertising. <laughs> that is like, sorry, I, this whole episode has been about how great podcasts are. Um, but no, I mean, I, I think, um, I think that's been like the greatest like return for us. Yeah, I'd put it there. I love that. Really cool. And question number six, last question, how do you deal with failure? What's your mindset and approach when? I think it's okay. I'm not one to get hung up on um, past failures. I definitely don't spend a lot of time looking back and I don't like to play the shoulda, woulda game because it just is absolutely useless. Um, it's fine to analyze things and like learn from the past, but I, I, I don't know. Failure is not something that I look at through like such a negative lens. And I see people who are just often paralyzed by it to the extent that they will never try something. And I think that's so horrible. Like, you know, that's just, it seems so boring to not have ever tried. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think there's nothing wrong with failure. I think it's just all learning. It's like, there's nothing, you know, and it's, I feel like I have this conversation constantly with two children who are extremely revealing themselves, like revealing themselves to be extremely competitive. And to the extent that like, sometimes they don't want to try things because they think they're going to fail. And I find this just like fascinating. So I'll have conversations with my kids around this often, and I'm really having a conversation with myself. So I, I don't know. I, I'm, I feel pretty good about failure. I think we should all be failing a lot more. And I think we should be talking about it more because, you know, for every like fantastic, you know, success story that you hear where the startup like did X, Y, and Z and this brand had this shiny exit, you know, there were a lot of failures to get there. And sometimes there are a lot of other failed brands even before that one that you never heard of because they were failures. So I don't know, you just have to like keep that in mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Totally. Keep going with the flow. Keep moving forward. Yeah, just continue. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show today and share so much of your journey, which is just incredible. Love it. Love it all. Love what you're doing now. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. This is great.